What are some of the other things that are misunderstood when it comes to infidelity in, in relationships? Okay, so one, this one I hear a lot. It's really fun. It's once a cheater, always a cheater. Mm-hmm. I think that's not true at all. Now, I agree with it when the person who has cheated does no work on themselves and is not willing to take a good hard look at what's going on or repair, then yes, that that behavior is pretty much going to repeat in that situation. But if the person is willing to look at you, well, here's what happened. Here's what's going on for me. Let me really look at this and shift it and do the work around it. Then that that is not that person not doomed to repeat that. So I think that's something that I hear that I don't think is um, true. I think another thing that I hear, and this is actually really prevalent in the treatment field, in the couples therapist world, is that infidelity is a relationship problem. That if if somebody is cheating, that that means there's something wrong in the relationship. Mm. And therefore... Go Keep ahead. going. Sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to... You hear that, like that, because... I, I think that's a big thing right there, right? I think that to me that speaks volumes to think, speak more to that. Like if it's not a relationship issue, then what is it? Yeah. Well, so I would say this, there's research on this among couples therapists. A couples therapists have the belief that it's a relationship issue if there's infidelity. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it has nothing to do with the relationship. And there are actual studies on this. There's recent studies with people from Ashley Madison and they've done some different studies of users on some of these websites and stuff who are like, yeah, no, I actually am really happy in my relationship. I'm cheating for other reasons. Um, And I think when you start to work with people and you start to look at like what's going on underneath this behavior, it often has to do with sense of self, what's going on inside of them about how they feel about themselves, regulating, like managing stress, managing their own self-esteem issues. It can be all kinds of different things that aren't rooted in a relationship problem. So I think that that is, that is something we need to reevaluate. And I think the treatment field really needs to reevaluate it um, and really think about how to look at that issue with a much broader lens and understanding that people treat for much bigger issues. And I think that it doesn't work well to say to the betrayed partner, oh, hey, by the way, it's your fault that your partner cheated. You know, that 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 is not a good approach <laughs> you know, in therapy. And most betrayed partners are going to feel like now they've been hurt again, you know, when that is the approach. But I will say this, and the research shows this, that this is the biggest approach that most couples therapists take on this issue. Is, it, is approaching it as a as a couple issue a relationship issue and it's both your faults wow um and so i think that needs to shift our thinking around that i think really needs to shift so that's that's another one that i think is a common misconception one of the things that we've experienced in our relationship is recognizing that there's like phases of healing that take place like we're at a point in our relationship right now where we have like we joke about it a lot sometimes because sometimes it feels like we have like a black belt in healing. Right. And then the next day we're quickly reminded that we really don't right. We're, (laughs) but there's definitely things that we're able to process and navigate and heal at this stage of our relationship than five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, So when you see infidelity happen in a relationship, what's, and I know that everything's different. I know that it's hard to always speak to, you know, because generalities are really hard because there's so many unique factors with every couple and every relationship and every situation. But what are some of the general things that you see when it comes to kind of the the journey of healing that takes place or that would need to take place, I guess, in order for two people to figure it out and make it work after something like this? Yeah, I think that it's a great question. It's something that I've been doing a lot of thinking about recently because I feel like as a treatment field, we kind of know how to work with a couple to some degree. We know how to work. uh, There's room to grow on this for sure, but we know how to work with a couple in the initial crisis and aftermath of infidelity. And, you know, during that period of time, 
often there's been a lot of egregious behavior in the relationship. There's been the lying, there's been the gaslighting, there's been the sexual betrayal. Maybe your health has been put at risk because there's been unprotected sex. There's, there's egregious behavior that we're dealing with. And so to, to move us back towards safety, we have to do things like set some serious boundaries in the relationship, ask for transparency around things, um, like, you know, so that w you can know what's going on. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do to build trust. People often separate in the house, the sexual relationship can go on hold for a period of time. I always, I kind of think of those as like, they're kind of the big guns that we use. They're the big hammers that we use in the early phases of things. And we're using those because we're dealing with behavior in the relationship that's been so damaging and has really destroyed the safety. I think what we're not as good at and that we need to grow on as a field is what comes after that. And what I see happen for a lot of betrayed partners in particular is they're sort of like in year two, three, four, five of healing post betrayal, but nobody's told them what the skills are there. And so when there's a bump in the road, they reach for one of the big hammers. They're like, you go, go sleep elsewhere. You're kicked out of the bedroom. You know, you're, you know, or now I'm not going to have any contact with you for a few days. You know, there's just like, they're kind of going back and reaching for these big things that they needed in the beginning to reestablish some safety, but that are not relationship building and are not really relational. And so to me, I think where we need to grow as a field is really understanding how to help people with this ladder healing, where it's ladder stages of healing, where we really need relational skills there, right? We need to be able to talk to one another um, when we are highly activated. We need to figure out how to push pause together, know we're activated, know how we're going to come back and work it through once we've settled a little bit. Um, we're going to give each other a little bit more grace around the activation. We're going to try not to do power over power under moves. You know, all of that stuff really needs to be learned and, and people need help with it in those in the later stage of healing. Because if you go back for the big hammers and you keep using those, you actually kind of destroy your relationship. If you're down here in the in the later stages, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes total sense, and I like the I like the way that you articulated it as well as kind of described it. I think that oh my goodness, I'm having such a hard time today. I have the thought that comes to my head, and then it immediately leaves. This but... is a big topic. It brings <laughs> up a lot, and so all these things that we're prepared to say, we're it's it's putting us in a bit of an activation space when you're hearing these things, and so being able to really grab your brain and work on I know I'm struggling with it right now. So I think like this is if you're listening to this you might be like what this is a lot of information. I feel like we're going really fast. We were meant to be the 